Hi, I'm Bryn Brody from um, UC Denver. I research activism through visual culture, and I really love anything that's subversive. Maybe it's the music I listened to in high school, but if it rages against the machine, I'm all in. So ratchet feminism is one way to subvert supremacy. We're gonna look at ratchet feminism on TikTok using content creator The King Kitty. All right, this is The King Kitty. Um, she uses song and dance to educate on topics that include sexuality, menstruation, higher education for black women, and the presence of misogyny in everyday life. She frequently responds to hateful messages she gets. Um, for example, this message on the screen that says, you should really cover up and stop writing sexual lyrics. She responds with a song that includes the lyrics, only do shit because I want to. It's time that you accept it. Got three degrees and I like sex. It's time that you respect it. But black women's sexuality in media is a contested site. So in this presentation, I'm gonna quickly outline visual culture as it applies to images of black women's sexuality. Then I'm gonna read The King Kitty's performances through two opposing black feminisms, respectability politics and ratchet feminism. And then I conclude with the assertion that social media is a potentially liberatory site of resistance to systems of oppression. So adding to the complexity of reading The King Kitty is her identity as a queer black woman. This um, TikTok video that I'm gonna play is her bisexual coming out song that she posted to TikTok on December 9th, 2021. The lyrics that you're gonna see on the screen are the lyrics that she created for the video. Sorry. All right. Are you in the closet? I mean, I was, but I guess I can come out now. Like a French fry at the bottom of my bag of chips. I didn't ask for this, but I'm the man. I did like my ability to eat food on some bread, but shit, I'm pretty good. With 215,000 likes and 3,363 reposts, the song has really taken off, especially when you consider the fact that the TikTok algorithm hasn't prioritized her the way it does some other content creators. It's cross-pollinated platforms, SoundCloud, Spotify, Facebook. Some audience members have responded very deeply to her experience some report laughing and crying out of joy when they first hear the song. Others comment that they use the song to come out to family and friends. One user commented, girl, I just use this song to come out to all my family on Facebook, including my church family, because my dad is a pastor. Thank you. So what is visual culture? Visual culture represents black women in one of two binary ways. 
either hypersexual Jezebel Sapphire types, like we can see in the movie poster for Booty Call on the left hand if you're facing it, or the de-sexed non-woman mammy figure, like we see in this scene from The Helt on the right. These stereotypes or controlling images add to the historic and current oppression of black women. Nicholas Murzoff, largely considered to be a pioneer in the field of visual culture studies, says, the question is, who claims the authority to look? Historically, the authority to look, as well as the authority to decide who is looked at and what those images mean, has been claimed by white men. Bell Hooks notes that the white imperial gaze began with enslavers who denied enslaved people the right to look back. The structure of slavery has reverberations today. White supremacist ideology positions black women outside the norms of respectability as defined by whiteness. Black women can never be respectable enough because the white imperial gaze has always already coded them as deviant. The white gaze enforces and reinforces respectability politics within the black community so that straightness becomes normalized and enforced by the black community because of the white gaze. That consigns black queer women to either invisibility or deviancy. But what is respectability politics? Some black feminists, like Bell Hooks, pictured on the screen, insist that the commodification of black sexuality feeds an insatiable media hunger for black bodies that plays into white supremacy. Writing about Beyonce's performance in Lemonade, Hooks says, it's all about the body and the body as commodity. This is certainly not radical or revolutionary. From slavery to the present day, black female bodies, clothed and unclothed, have been bought and sold." End quote. Hooks would argue that with the commodification of her body, the King Kitty participates in her own oppression. I disagree. And as we'll see in the next couple of slides, other scholars consider black queer sexuality as potentially liberatory. Professor Jose Esteban Munoz, pictured on the screen, studied queer of color aesthetic practices and theorized that minority subjects work with, resist, the conditions of impossibility that dominant culture generates. In other words, because oppressed people live within the ideologies and material structures that oppress them, the drive toward justice comes from and must accommodate the need to survive. According to Munoz, oppressed people who have been coded deviant incorporate those controlling images in creative performances that counter the discourse that coded them as deviant in the first place. They defy white normativity, which is also heteronormativity, by publicly enacting a bigger, more over-the-top version of those controlling images that explode the stereotypes. Other similarly oppressed people recognize that counterperformance and then feel empowered to likewise resist that dominant narrative. Some theorists like Jillian Hernandez contend that performances in excess of whiteness create discomfort in the audience. Discomfort is that productive part of the performance. The discomfort returns oppression back to the oppressor. Ratchet feminism works alongside disidentification. Dr. Lamonda Horton Stallings, um, picture on the screen, chair and professor of African American studies at Georgetown, defines ratchet as, quote, 
foolishness, ignorant, hoishness, ghetto, and a dance, end quote. Ratchetness isn't the failure to be respectable, it's the performance of the failure to be respectable. Speaking about Beyonce and in contrast to Dr. Hook's argument, professor of black studies Omiseki Tinsley, pictured on the screen, writes that Ratchet creates a new, quote, jewel-laden, spectacularly abundant fantasy of black feminist imagination, an alternative unreality where black women are our own wealth, where our sexuality can glitter. So what about visual culture in the digital world? Dr. Tina Camp on the screen, currently professor of humanities at Princeton University, researches images of black and African diaspora using post-colonial and feminist theories. She forms as part of her argument the thesis that technology can function as one vehicle to achieve a black gaze not defined by or in relationship to the white imperial gaze. She says that technology can have liberatory effects as it portrays, quote, our everyday lives, the beauty of our bodies, our naive and bold aspirations, and our hopes and dreams for changing our current reality. Cyberspace is a borderland, right? A space between the tangible physical world and a world created out of imagination and code. It can operate as a liberatory space where new images and new definitions can be created and then replicated. But it can also be recommitted to white supremacy. Dr. Maria Fernandez, pictured on the screen, researches the history of media, including digital and new media, using post-colonial gender studies. She identifies some disturbing aspects of cyberspace alongside some of the positive aspects. She says, because it is possible to receive images from anywhere in the world in seconds, the net has the possibility of obliterating hierarchies and homogenizing difference. Multiculturalism and multinational capitalism are complexly interconnected. Indeed, we see the King Kitty's capitalist goals through her frequent pleas to record labels to sign her. Her desire for monetization is tied up with her online activism, including ratchet feminism. I love this image of her. The King Kitty wearing sunglasses and a rainbow bikini. Her sexuality glitters. She delights in her body and that joy shows in her performances. The people most often oppressed by visual culture are the same people who are historically kept out of decision-making power in traditional media. TikTok expands visual culture, creating new avenues for self-expression where black queer women like the King Kitty seize the tools of domination from the hands of the enslavers, rendering those tools useless as weapons of white supremacy. This picture of the King Kitty in her cap and gown remind us that TikTok is a site for performing identities. The King Kitty has three degrees, a bachelor's in math, bachelor's in computer science, and a master's in computer science. The King Kitty's performance of Jezebel is a representation of her racially gendered identity, but it is also an artificial performance of that identity. Although bell hooks would disagree, I, along with theorists like Omiseki Tinsley and Jose Esteban Munoz, insist that ratchetness explodes white normativity. It explodes the whole concept of respectability by performing identities in excess of the controlling images that the white gaze has used to objectify people. I argue that social media offers us enormous potential for long-lasting, liberating social change. Thank you. <laughs>